Today is December 12, 2021. This is the Sunday edition of Wilderness Wanderings, containing the scripture and sermon from our worship service at Emmanuel. You can find a link to the whole service on our website. May God bless you as you participate. scripture reading today, as I mentioned, is from Daniel chapter 9. You may recall that Daniel was among those who were brought to Babylon as part of the Israelite exile because of their sin. And the Babylonians were eventually defeated by the Medes and Persians, and Daniel lived to see that transition of power. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants or prophets who spoke to your na- in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what you have done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, All this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away from your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Listen, Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your name bear, and your people bear your name. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. The first time that I can remember having to deal with with my own sin and the shame that it brings, began on a Sunday morning. Having woken up, I wasn't feeling 100%. And I somehow convinced my parents to let me stay home from church. I think it was the one and only time I ever managed that. And so at about 930 a station wagon full of my parents and my siblings, there were eight of us all told, so that was a car of nine that left, 
left me all by myself in our great big farmhouse. And the moment they left, I remember feeling just fine. And I had a glorious two and a half to three hours all to myself. What was I going to do? Well, as I recall the story, my stomach told me that I needed some food. And my memory told me that it was the days where the schools that we attended were selling chocolates. And one of my siblings had a box of chocolates stashed in the house. And that sounded like a really good thing to eat. And so sometime later, I had a bunch of chocolate wrappings in my hands without chocolate. And I hadn't really paid attention to how much I had eaten. So I wasn't quite sure how many dollars to put in that container to make sure that, you know, they could pay their bill at the end of the day. But actually, that wasn't my greatest concern. My greatest concern was these wrappers. I had to do something with them. I had to hide them. And I'll admit to you that that wasn't a moment of great intelligence. I decided to hide them in my closet where they were, well, not very well hidden. So the story continues the next day after school, after chores, and I think it was after supper, that my dad grabbed me by the elbow or the shoulder or something and dumped me in his study. And he says, you wait here, I'll be back. And you all know that when a dad says something like that, you know you're in trouble. I knew I was in trouble. And I was quite sure I knew why I was in trouble. And my dad allowed me to sit there for a while and to wait. And what I recall most about sitting there waiting for judgment to fall was that I wanted to flee. I just wanted to hide somewhere, hoping that this would all go away. Today, I want to deal with you with this issue of sin. I know it's not a politically correct topic, but it's something that we Christians still have some capacity to deal with in our age. And along with sin, I want to deal with the issues that it brings. And as I mentioned in my little story, which is true, when we sin, we feel guilt. And guilt is that capacity to look at something that we've done and say, I did something wrong. To know that we have broken some kind of a law, to done something we weren't supposed to do, or maybe not done something that we were supposed to do. To kind of know that. But I also want to deal with shame, and in our particular passage from Daniel 9, the word shame comes up a lot more often. And, and shame is, is not so rational, shame is very motive. And it's not just that we know we have done something wrong. But we feel it. And and more than just having done something wrong, we feel that we are wrong. It's not just that we don't measure up in the actions that we do, but we have this gut feeling that we ourselves don't measure up. It's not just our actions are wrong, but in our heart, we feel that we are wrong. We know that I knew that my dad was angry. I knew I was in trouble. But it's more than that. It is a sense that that because of what we've done, we are unlovable. Those people that are in relationship with us will ditch us. Because we're not worth it anymore. That's shame. Shame makes us want to flee. To withdraw from human companionship and from God himself. The Bible tells us that this is at the heart of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, it says in the scriptures... 
and they were ashamed and they hid. Sin causes shame, which causes us to flee and withdraw. Now, of course, there's more to be said about shame. and I'm not going to say everything that can be said about it. But I think we need to understand that, that shame isn't something that bubbles up from within, but something that can also be placed upon us from outside, from other people. And we see that today in this thing that we call cancel culture, a form of shunning, a form of ostracism, where somebody is thrust out, is, is deleted from, from fa- or as a Facebook friend, as, as a Twitter follower, someone that's banned from, becoming, from being part of social circles. We see that, of course, in celebrity culture, in the sports culture, because of certain things that, that are done or not done. In order to induce shame, I just want to ask one question about that concept of cancel culture. And and that is this. Who gets to decide who gets canceled? And we all know the answer is that there's... Nobody really has that authority, but people do it anyways. there's, there's There's no guidebook. There's no... There's no rule book that says if you break these rules, then you get canceled. It's it's random acts of of canceling. It's whoever has the loudest voice gets to ruin other people's lives. Shame is brought upon us, not just by cancel culture, by all kinds of other things, too. This is a quote from the Hamilton Spectator in this past week, an article written by somebody who had a form of physical disability. I've never been able to wear high-heeled shoes, and I've always been ashamed of this because high heels are constantly in my face as a symbol of beauty. If we take a few moments to ponder that line, we begin to we can see underneath the words the sense that this particular writer is feeling unworthy, unbeautiful, because high heels are not an option. Somehow this writer doesn't belong to that category we all want to belong to of the beautiful. And there is shame. Now, having said all of that, to sort of put forward a sense of shame and how it might come, and there are other things that could be said about it. I want to narrow down into our passage where, where we come to the understanding that sin and all of its consequences and ripple effects, sin is at the root of human misery, of all the trouble in this world. But this sin that we talk about as Christians is not because we've randomly broken some rule book. It's not because somebody out there gets to tell us that we have sinned. But that sin is is part of our relationship with God. And that sin is a violation of God's shalom, of the the goodness of the creation with which it was made. Because before Adam and Eve were ashamed and hid, it says, and it was good. This is the word of the Lord as he looks out on the creation. It was good. It was very good. And I want you to remember that as we talk about sin and guilt and shame and all that's encompassed with it, that it is not the first word of the Scriptures. The first word of the Scriptures. And God said it about us. It is very good. That's where the story begins. Sin then breaks down that shalom, that goodness. 
that keeps us from God and from each other. We see it in the face of every battered woman, whether she was battered by her husband or somebody else. We hear it in the cry of every neglected child. We see it in the eyes, the despair of every addict on our city streets. We witness it in the death of every victim of every war. Sin breaks God's shalom. Now understand that sin is more than just the things that we do. It's more than just lying and cheating and even killing. But sin talks about our, our motivations, our desires. That we want to be at the top of the pile. That we want to be there at the beauty. We want people to look up to us and say, wow. And we do all kinds of things to get there and to be there. And today, we do lots of things that we know that we shouldn't. But we do them anyways because we don't want to get canceled. We want to stay in vogue. And so we're willing to do things to make that happen. Sin is about our motives, our emotions. Sin is about disturbing, ruining the shalom of God. It breaks our relationship with God and with others. Sin, historically, is what the church dealt with. Now let me help you understand what I mean by that. Today, churches tend to, to be involved in building big churches. And pastors are obsessed with building big churches. But before that, the church dealt with sin. When I was a, a young minister, fresh out of seminary in my first congregation, trying to figure out what I was supposed to be doing, it's a hard thing to figure out. I'm not sure I quite got there yet, but I'm working on it. But people would say to me, well, how's it going? And, and so I was involved in this brand new life, trying to figure out what church ministry was, like, was about. And they would say, well, how's it going? It was like, um, um. And, and so finally, I, I, I learned to say this. Well, I get to be on the front lines of sin and grace. And grace always wins. And as I've worked in ministry for the next 25 years, I discovered that this is indeed true. The church's business is sin and grace. And to tell the story that grace always wins. And so our, our story is not primarily about sin. It's not primarily about shame. It's about something else. Something bigger and deeper and more wholesome. But we need to understand that sin is this. Not paying attention to God. Not listening. Not giving God his due. Daniel begins his prayer. God, holy and mighty and righteous. And I think Daniel does something wonderful for us in, in, in sort of illustrating, giving us an example of how to begin our prayers. We begin by addressing God and remembering who he is. Because it puts prayer in context. It helps us when we pray. And Daniel then talks about Israel's shame and sin. That the prophets of God had come to Israel over and over again. That God had sent them and they had talked to the kings and they had talked to the priests. And they had talked to the officials and they had talked to the people. And guess what all these folks did? They closed their ears. And the more the prophets came and the more the prophets talked, the harder they closed their ears. So they wouldn't have to hear what God said because they didn't want to hear. And the harder they closed their ears, the blinder they became 
to the effects of sin and the damage that was happening in their society. And they were destroying one another. And God finally sent them in exile, exile as he has promised. They were covered with shame, says Daniel, because of their sin. Israel was in ruins. Jerusalem was a heap of rubble. And Israel was covered in shame. That's Daniel's prayer, his confession. We have done wrong. But the biblical story doesn't dwell there. It doesn't want us to stay there. Because as I said, it begins with God's declaration, it is very good. And Daniel, reading the scriptures, understands that Israel is going to be restored. That there is restoration, that God is not going to keep Israel in her shame, but is going to lift her up and renew her. And so he begins to pray for that renewal. And that, too, is the Christian story. When we find ourselves deeply immersed in sin, we need to hear the biblical story that this is not the heart of the matter. It is very good was the beginning. And the end of the scripture says, Behold, I am making everything new. And Daniel's prayer that God would restore Israel in the New Testament becomes the prayer, Maranatha, come Lord, come and finish your redemption. When we find ourselves mired in sin, the response need not be despair. When we find ourselves covered by shame, whether it's our own or it's shame that's being placed on us by other people, we do not have to think that that is the end of the story. The end of the story is God's declaration, I am making all things new. That the goodness that God declared in the beginning would be there again. God is in the process of renewing the world. Daniel's story that comes about by Daniel unplugging his ears and listening, hearing the scriptures. He's reading Jeremiah, and God has said to Jeremiah, I will restore Israel after 70 years. And so, you know, when, when some of us hear the promises of God, we become a bit skeptical. And we kind of sit back and we say, okay, God, show me. And we kind of distance ourselves from God and, and say, well, wait and see. But Daniel instead, he gets down on his knees and he says, Lord, make it happen. Lord, this is what you promised. Israel is in shame. And, 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 and then he goes farther and he says, Lord, your name is covered with shame because of what's happened to Israel. And so, Lord, come and fulfill your promises Renew Israel, bring them back, restore Jerusalem. Let your name be filled with glory and cover your people with glory. Daniel listens, he confesses, and he prays. The biblical story is one of grace, of renewal. This is what God says to Zephaniah. Listen. Well, they were in Babylon. He says, I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Honor and praise instead of shame. That's what God promises his people. Hebrews, is a little complicated, but this is what the writer of Hebrews says, but we do see Jesus already given a crown of glory and honor. He was made little lower than the angels for a little while. He suffered death. By the grace of God, he tasted death for everyone 
That is why he was given his crown. God has made everything. He is now bringing many sons and daughters to share in his glory. It is only right that Jesus is the one to lead them into their salvation. That's because God made him perfect by his sufferings. And Jesus, who makes people holy, and the people he makes holy belong to the same family. So listen, Jesus is not ashamed to call you and me brothers and sisters. Now the irony, the irony of this story is this, and we find it in the Gospel of John. I invite you sometime to read that Gospel again and pay attention to the combination of three things. The first is Jesus talks about his hour or his time. That is not quite time yet, but his time is coming. And then he, he, he partners that time with his glory. That whatever this time is about, it is about glory. And then he fuses that with the third thing. And that is his cross. That his hour of glory is the cross. Now understand, understand what the cross is. That the cross is the Jews and the Romans together pointing their fingers at Jesus and say, you are not worthy. You are bad. You are unlovable. It is the Jews and the Romans pointing their finger at Jesus and saying, we cancel you. You are history. We want nothing more to do with you. And Jesus receives that. And he wraps up all the shame and the sin of the world in his arms and he carries it to the cross. And that is his glory because he removes the shame and the sin from us and with, on the cross he covers us in glory. Then we do not have to live in the shame and the sin of the world. That we do not have to live with the shame that other people place upon us or the shame that our hearts bubble up and declare that we are unworthy. He covers us with his own glory. And he is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. This is the story of the Bible. That the shame of the world, our shame, is covered with the glory of God. So, until Jesus comes, we need to live in a world that loves to cancel people, that still dabbles in sin and shame. And we ask ourselves the question, how do we live in such a culture, a world of shame? First thing I think is we follow Daniel's example and we pray. And we say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. And in doing that, in praying this prayer, we make two great declarations. First of all is that we can't win the war. The war are, isn't ours to win. Winning belongs to God. We are called to stand, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6. We are called to stand in the face of evil and all the arrows of the evil one. Winning belongs to the Lord. But in doing that, we also make this other declaration that God is king. That all the authorities of this world, the presidents, and the prime ministers and the dictators. All the economic powerhouses like Walmart and Amazon and Facebook and, and all the others. That they do not have ultimate power. But that power belongs to God. And he can and he will dethrone all who would like to be sovereign. When we pray, it is an act of rebellion against the world. We declare that God is God. He is the awesome God. Second thing we do is we live well. While Daniel is praying, while Darius is ruler of Babylon, this is what Daniel's, this is what's happening in chapter 6. 
It pleased Darius to appoint 120 royal rulers over his entire kingdom. He placed three leaders over them. One of the leaders was Daniel. The royal rulers were made accountable to the three leaders. Then the king wouldn't lose any of his wealth. Daniel did a better job than the other two leaders or any of the royal rulers. He was an unusually good and able man. So the king planned to put him in charge of the whole kingdom. But the other two leaders and the royal rulers heard about it. So they looked for a reason to bring charges against Daniel. They tried to find something wrong with the way he ran the government. But they weren't able to. They couldn't find any fault with his work. He could always be trusted. He never did anything wrong. And he always did what he was supposed to do, what he was supposed to. Daniel, in the face of all the sinfulness of Babylon and the empire of the Medes and Persians, he did what was right. He lived in righteousness. He lived a life of beauty and joy. He did not repay evil with evil or anger with anger or cancel with cancel. Rather, he lived with forgiveness and reconciliation. He lived in the beauty of the shalom that only God can create. In the midst of a world that still lives in shame, that is ruled by sinfulness and shame and guilt, we are called to live by grace. We are called to live well to do our work well, so others cannot find fault with us. The biblical story is that God has not left us in shame. He covers us in glory so we can pass that glory on. This, my friends, is the biblical story. It's right there in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve were ashamed and they hid. And God comes into the garden with a question. Where are you? And he calls Adam and Eve out of hiding. And then the Lord made clothes for them. And he covered their shame. As Adam and Eve were covered with those clothes, so the Lord Jesus Christ would cover us with his glory. That we do not have to live in our sinfulness and shame, but in the freedom of the shalom that God brings us through Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking our shame upon the cross. Fill our hearts with a longing for that day when all things will be made new. As we celebrate your birth, may the eyes of our faith reach forward, longing for that day when you will indeed have made all things new. And the goodness, the very goodness of the creation will be restored. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening in. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow as we continue our daily devotions and our wilderness wanderings. As you journey on into the week ahead, go with the blessing of God. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.